Today I decided to surprise you by not wearing anything white because I'm just so random like that. So recently I found a show that I've never watched before called Super Size vs. Super Skinny. It's a British show where you have someone who is overweight and someone who is underweight and they're brought together for a week to swap their diets and eat what the other usually eats. The major thing that everyone seems to remember about this show is that there's these huge tubes that they use to show how much that person eats and how much it fills the tube and for some reason people are really obsessed about what their own diet would look like in the tube but today I'm not going to talk about the tubes I'm actually going to talk about an interesting part in the episodes where both people on the show get together and look at their pictures from previous years and how they used to look compared to how they look now and what they think caused them to either lose so much weight that they are now underweight or gain so much weight that they are now obese so that's a really nice segue to what we're going to talk about today which is how stress and anxiety affect our diets. When we see these people trying to understand how their diets changed the way they did, there's a theme that at least I found around the culprit being either anxiety or stress or even depression. Most of my weight problems have been around times where I've either been stressed or unhappy. The business has struggled lately, but you know, the stress makes you want to eat. Then being down because you're so big makes you want to eat and it's very easy to turn to food. I don't have the time to eat with the lifestyle that I lead because I have two jobs I'm literally always really busy and just miss meals because of that and just suppress it the reason I wanted to do this show is because I'm the lowest weight that I've ever been so I thought it would be interesting for us to go out there and look at the evidence that exists and try and explain how it is that stress and anxiety can make our diets change so much so I think it's best for us to start by understanding what is stress and how is it different from anxiety it's important to know and recognize that stress and anxiety are absolutely normal and necessary for our bodies to function so yeah I'm going to tell you the popular story about how in primitive times we needed our fight or flight response in order to survive in the wild. If we were out and about looking for food and all of a sudden we have a tiger in front of you, this natural mechanism from our body would help us react, either stay and fight the tiger, run away to safety, or freeze and probably die. So in this situation, the tiger is the stressor that triggers this response from our body. Nowadays, it is very much unlikely that our stressors are going to be predatory animals, unless you live in Australia, I guess. Nowadays, it's much more likely that our stressors are going to be things like work deadlines, schoolwork, money problems, being bullied, being ill, losing a loved one, divorce, ending a friendship, etc. It can even be small things like a car rushing in front of you out of nowhere on the road or hearing a loud noise or a bang. Stressors don't actually need to be negative things, they can also be positive things. So for example, having a job interview can cause you stress, but it's actually a positive experience. Moving apartments or planning for a wedding or even having a baby can be positive stressors as well. An important thing to remember is that different people react differently to stress. What can be stressful to one person might not be stressful to another. Some people may be more stress resistant and not experience a strong response even if they have multiple stressors consecutively, whereas someone may have a stronger response to a single trigger event. For some people, even thinking about a stressful event causes them stress. The main definition here is that stress is triggered by an event and it should be temporary. If you take the stressor away, then the stress should go away as well. So if the tiger goes away, you should no longer feel stressed. But if the stressor is persistent, for example, growing up in a dysfunctional family, being in a toxic relationship or living with illness, then stress can turn into chronic stress or even develop into depression down the line. Stress can also be accompanied by or lead to anxiety. Anxiety is very similar to stress. However, anxiety does not need to be triggered by a single event. It's generally defined by persistent worrying that doesn't go away even if there's no stressor present. So in our example from the tiger, let's say the tiger appears, you have a stress response to being in front of a tiger. But if the tiger goes away, if you then go to your cave and you spend the night worrying, what if the tiger comes back, then that will be anxiety. Stress and anxiety, however, have common physical symptoms that include rising blood pressure, fast breathing, sweating, loss of sleep, even insomnia, tense muscles, upset stomach, pain, headaches, and even feeling pins and needles. Emotional reactions can include feeling 
angry, irritable, burnt out, having concentration issues, feeling fatigued, feeling restlessness or even forgetful, and even sadness. So now let's go into the science of how stress and anxiety affect your diet. I need to preface this by saying that much of the research that's out there on this topic is animal research, so in the future we may have new information come out as more and more human studies are performed. But regardless, it's still a good starting point. So I'm going to try and not give you flashbacks of your chemistry teacher in middle school, but I just need to explain a few things and I'll try and make it as entertaining as possible, so bear with me. So in our brain we have little proteins called neuropeptides. Neuropeptides are like messengers that carry messages to cells in our body. So I'm not even going to bother you with names, but I'll show them on screen if you're interested. So we have these ones which increase your appetite, they increase your motivation to eat and how frequently you eat and how much you eat. And then we have these ones. And these ones do the exact opposite. They suppress your appetite. There's a few exceptions here and there, but I'm just giving you the cliff notes to keep this simple. So yeah, we have our hungry neuropeptides and our not hungry neuropeptides. So in normal situations, these neuropeptides are regulated by two very important hormones, which many of you will have heard from, which is leptin and ghrelin. These hormones are like the maestro of the orchestra, the conductor, let's say. Leptin is the satiety hormone. When leptin says, well, I think that's enough food, we can stop eating. Then it tells these neuropeptides to express themselves, to go and tell the cells in our body to stop feeling so hungry. So then that makes these hungry neuropeptides stop expressing themselves so much. On the other hand, when ghrelin, the hunger hormone, thinks that it's time for you to eat again, then it tells these hungry neuropeptides to express themselves and go tell the cells in your body to feel hungry and peckish. Then by regulation, these neuropeptides stop expressing expressing themselves so much. In simple terms, they regulate each other. So now knowing all of this, let's see what happens when we have a fight or flight response. So as to say you just saw the tiger in front of you, it seems like it's going to absolutely eat you alive. In our brain we have a control room called the hypothalamus, and that control room is pretty much the boss of our hormones and our responses. So when we see the tiger, the hypothalamus, the control room, thinks, oh no, we need to do something about this, we need to react. So the hypothalamus releases a hormone called CRH, and this hormone makes these neuropeptides stop expressing themselves so much. So it's going to suppress your appetite. This hormone is sent to our pituitary gland in our brain, which is more or less the manager of the hormones in our body. And the pituitary gland is going to take that as an instruction to release another hormone. This hormone is ACTH, and it's going to work to put you on high alert and to suppress your appetite in an acute stress situation. This is very helpful because if you see a tiger in front of you, obviously the last thing you're going to want to be thinking about is how good it would be to be munching on a bag of chips. <laughs> Most importantly, ACTH is going to tell our adrenal glands to produce a hormone called cortisol, which is what we know as the stress hormone. In acute stress situations, cortisol is a neuphorogenic, so it's going to give you that boost to run away from the tiger, or to fight the tiger if you're that brave. But also it's going to inhibit these neuropeptides even further, and it's going to ask these ones to express themselves more. During an acute stress situation, we also produce two additional hormones, epinephrine, adrenaline, and norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Both of these hormones also join the party in suppressing these hungry neuropeptides and making these ones express themselves even more. So now we know that in an acute stress situation we have all of these things going on to really suppress our appetite. But what if it isn't an acute stress situation? What if it's chronic stress or even anxiety? Chronic stress or anxiety occur when the body experiences stressors so frequently or so intensely that the body doesn't have a chance or an opportunity to trigger a relaxation response with the regularity that it should. Therefore, the body is in a constant state of physiological arousal. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about cortisol. So we talked about cortisol as the stress hormone and we have seen how it acts to suppress your appetite in an acute stress situation. But now the interesting thing is that in moments of perceived non-stress, cortisol actually has the opposite effect it increases your appetite. Researchers are still unclear of what the mechanism is that triggers cortisol to change from suppressing your appetite to increasing your appetite in moments of stress or non-stress. But in short, what we know is that the fight or flight response releases both 
substances that increase your appetite and substances that decrease your appetite. What research has shown so far is that depending on how people respond to stress, the results of experiencing stress can lead to either overeating or undereating. Specifically and interestingly, what some studies have found is that stress will result in undereating when high calorie palatable food is not present. But if high calorie palatable food is present, then stress will lead to overeating. This may be explained by some research that has found that people in stressful situations give preference to energy-dense foods, high in fat and sugar. Studies have also found that chronic stress seems to disrupt sensory-specific satiety signaling, which is basically the mechanism that stops us from eating the same foods over and over again. So now this idea that we will overeat when we have high calorie, high fat, high sugar foods present, but undereat if that kind of food is not present really rings a bell with me. <laughs> I've definitely seen this in myself. So for example, now I work in an office where post pandemic people are not really coming in. So there's not a lot of candy or anything. So if I'm having a really stressful day at work, I will just forget about eating. I need to proactively put breaks in my calendar to remind myself to eat because otherwise I will just be so stressed that until my stomach starts growling at me I will just not stop or even remember to eat. But if I remember pre-COVID times when I was working in an office on a team of about 100 people almost every day was someone's birthday people were always bringing cake and someone baked cookies on the weekend and they brought the leftovers or something if I was feeling stressed you best believe your girl Jessie was going to go over there and get and a slice of cake because I need to soothe my emotions. <laughs> but on a more serious note, in the most severe cases, the suppression of appetite can actually lead to stress or anxiety-induced anorexia, which has been studied and it has been linked to some of the hormones involved in the fight or flight response. On the other end of the spectrum, stress eating can lead to obesity, binge eating disorders, or even food addiction. I just want to reiterate that stress itself doesn't cause weight loss or weight gain per se. What it does is it increases or decreases your motivation to eat, how much you eat, how frequently you eat, and then in turn that can result in a caloric deficit or surplus, which will then result in weight loss or weight gain accordingly. What I really wanted to bring awareness to was this mechanism so that you can keep mindful of your eating habits and if they're changing because of stress or anxiety. Now I'm going to give you a list of things that you can do or keep mindful of so that you can manage stress in your diet and avoid drastic changes to your eating habits. The first one would be to acknowledge the signs. Sometimes we're just so stressed and so anxious that we don't even realize how the stress and the anxiety are affecting us. Maybe journaling or having a worry time every day. Simple tools that we can do to just keep mindful of how do we feel, how is it affecting us, and just to reflect on that. The second thing would be to identify your stressors. Identifying what's causing it can be a helpful tool to tackle the issue and maybe manage how we react to that. The third point is to get plenty of sleep. There are many studies that have linked poor sleep and poor sleep quality with weight gain and obesity. So definitely if we are stressed, sleeping can help us manage our stress better, respond better, react better, and perhaps avoid stress eating even more. The fourth point is one that I actually practice myself. I was just giving you the example of when I'm in the office and it's to at least try to eat on a schedule. So this has nothing to do with intermittent fasting or anything. Every day I will have my breakfast at the same time, lunch roughly at the same time, 12 p.m., there I am heating up my Tupperware in the kitchen. <laughs> I may have a snack mid-morning or a snack mid-afternoon, but breakfast, lunch, and dinner usually are always at the same time. I've been doing this for many years, and what I find is that because it's roughly always the same number of hours between meals, when it's time for the next meal, my stomach will let me know. <laughs> a tip for those that usually feel nausea or indigestion when they're feeling anxious or stressed is to try and find foods that you can tolerate. Usually this will be bland foods that don't have a lot of spices or fat. So lean chicken breast, white rice, at the very least some rice cakes or salt crackers in between meals or a piece of fruit. Exercise is amazing for relieving stress, reducing the intake of alcohol, drugs and caffeine because these substances can often make anxiety symptoms worse, not better. There's also growing research that good nutrition can improve your mood and your mental health and well-being. And then priority management, time management, breathing exercises, relaxation techniques are also good for relieving stress and anxiety symptoms. And finally, talking, talking to anyone, talking to your dog, talking to your sister or brother or parents or your spouse. Talking is good to just 
vent it out. Sometimes other people might have solutions or suggestions of how to manage your problems or your stress in different ways that you haven't thought about. So definitely don't dismiss speaking to other people. And that's it. I hope you liked this video. Research has shown that subscribing to my channel will improve your knowledge of something by at least 1%. So hit that subscribe button. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.